welcome, Anthony. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Rachel. I would love to share screen. Yeah, so there's a little computer button kind of where the speaker and the camera button is. There's like a little computer. You just click that. There you go. Do you, does everybody see this? And um, can you still see me as well? I can still see me. Yes, I can still see you a little in a little square at the bottom. Great. Uh, you'll see all my hand gestures. <laughs> important. Um, That's an important part. Yeah. Yes. Great. Ready when you are. All right. Well, thanks, Rachel. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Anthony Dente. Uh, I'm I'm here. Uh, I I originally was um, going to talk only about the Cobb Research Institute and the Cobb Code development, uh, but uh, since um, some other folks weren't here, maybe representing and specifically engineering of hemp lime, or hempcrete, or even other straw uh, natural building systems, I've kind of broadened the topic, and I have three areas I'm going to run through. Uh, one, just, um, I, I guess, uh, codes, uh, permits, and structural systems that apply to uh, each natural building uh, format, and then uh, testing. And uh, for, for me, all these three things are connected. We're constantly um, pursuing permits for, for real jobs and finding out uh, what kind of questions we're being asked, what, what kind of questions we're asking, um, going conducting the testing to get those answers. And, uh, and then if we have enough testing, we pursue codification of that information to make it easier for others. Uh, and then we go back around and try to get more permits. So uh, I'm the principal, uh, one of the three principals and owners of Verdon Structural Engineers. This is just a number of my colleagues. We've, we've grown a lot recently. We're now up to 17 human beings. Um, mostly engineers, uh, I, uh, a builder contractor and, a, and an office manager as well. And, um, really uh, privileged to work with all these folks. Uh, we're, we're based in Berkeley, California, but we work all across the country, um, dominantly up and down the West Coast, uh, Utah um, and New Mexico, Arizona. But, uh, you know, we're doing a straw bale distillery in New York right now and uh, other places. We've, uh, we've engineered over 200 custom natural building projects, and they, they take all kinds of forms. You know, numbers and quantification of these uh, things can be difficult uh, because some projects are huge and some projects are tiny. And some projects are tiny, but they use really radical materials, so they take forever. Um, and so anyway, the take it for what it's worth. But we do have a lot of experience in, in all the systems I'll be talking about today. And, and most systems in the natural building realm and low carbon building realm that you can think of um, we've been trying, we, we try to stay completely up to date. We want to see all this move forward. We're very passionate about it. Um, here's a, you know, just a few more photographs, uh, even, even our bamboo systems. That was a Nepal, uh, earthquake rebuild, straw bale, rubble trench foundation, bamboo roof system. Uh, a lot of complications with that rounder system. And then I, as mentioned, I'm the vice president of the Cobb Research Institute, which, uh, like the, uh, U.S., Hemp Building Association, we're a nonprofit uh, pursuing codification and easier access to building with uh, the material cob, which is a monolithic adobe. It's a clay, sand, and straw matrix, and I'll speak more to that. But I'm and now's a good time to share that I'm uh, I was the lead engineer for the U.S. Hemp Building Association's. Uh, Hempcrete Appendix, Hemp Lime, Hempcrete Appendix. I am very involved with CASPA, the California Straw Building Association, and TAG, the Earth Builders Guild, which Ben Losher is going to be speaking uh, next or later about. They're uh, dominantly Adobe CEB focused in the in the Southwest, and uh, I yeah, the Natural Building Alliance. I love those folks out there in Colorado, and um, you know we work a lot with Cal Earth and Super Adobe and Earth Bag. So. Um, I just happen to have this title with the Cobb Research Institute, um, but but as an engineer, you know, it, I, I'm generally a subconsultant, so I get to have my hands in everything, I do, and that's important because they're all related, as we'll talk about here. But first, we'll start with building codes and um, natural building system building codes have advanced a lot in my time as a practicing engineer, which is now about 13, 14 years. Uh, I moved to California from Pennsylvania uh, 2008 to design straw bale buildings under Kevin Donahue, my now business partner and our senior engineer. And uh, back then, even straw bale was not a codified 
system nationally. There, there were local codes and, and some international examples. But I, so we started with almost all the materials I'm going to talk about today. My engagement with them started under this provision of the International Building Code, which takes a different name in California. We call it the uh, California Building Code. Most of it is exactly the same. I'm happy to talk specifically if, if there are any California folks out, um, just the subtle differences there. But uh, yeah, IBC 10411, Alternative Materials, Designs and Methods of Construction and Equipment. Um, you know, slideshow 101, don't read your slide, but this is a very important section of the code uh, stating that uh, this uh, uh, provided, yeah, the provisions of this code are not intended to prevent or uh, the installation of any material or to prohibit any design or method of construction not specifically prescribed in this code. Um, provided that such an alternative has been approved and uh, and then th they approve it if it meets the intent of the building code is another important piece of language there. And this is a really strong section in the code. It's small, it's not a big section, uh, but almost even today with all these codes we're about to look at on natural building, we're normally at least breaking one or two rules and therefore our design technically applies to 104.11. Uh, happy to talk more about that. It's, you know, it's a t code technicality. I live in a code technicality world as a uh, practicing licensed engineer. And it's, uh, it's not incredibly complicated. It's just a, a language that a lot of people don't speak because they don't have to. Um, here is a list of all the natural building codes, uh, a, a generally complete list. Uh, there are, there are others that aren't on this list. Um, and if anyone, you know, knows of some that aren't here, please share them in the chat. Other people might be interested. Uh, but this, uh, it's a lot of the natural building codes have entered the code realm, the national code realm through the IRC, the International Residential Code Appendix. And it's an easy first step for material. The residential code is a prescriptive code, not a performance code. As an engineer, I live in the IBC, the International Building Code, or the California Building Code, which is a prescriptive code. And it allows full freedom. It just tells you how strong a material is, what its uh, strictest limitations are. And then uh, you can design anything you want that says, stays within that bounds. Whereas the IRC is like, oh, you're building a 10 foot long building? Well, your rafters have to be exactly this size made of this material, done. And even the IRC appendix isn't officially adopted by each state. And this is something that all the natural building and natural building system organizations uh, it can work together on because the you kind of need to call each state, find out who's in charge of it. In California, it's uh, uh, the health um, HCD and uh, health. Uh, anyway, that's not so important. I can find that acronym for you. If, uh, if you'd like to know it, but uh, it's it's a tedious task. It's a huge lift to get these codes passed in the first place and then to go around and call every state and say, are, are you definitely adopting this appendix? But if you're making one call for one appendix, you might as well make the call for all appendices. So if you live in a state and you um, are engaged with the, the powers that be uh, from the building department level, uh, let let me know or let um, Jacob know and uh, we, we would love to engage you with that process of contacting those folks. But I... Um, this th this is a, a wonderful list, uh, in my opinion. I'm, I'm really impressed by the advancements uh, in the code realm that natural building has made over the years. And I, I put these red arrows here uh, because these are the codes and the and the, the current efforts that are happening that I'm the lead engineer on. Um, and then in blue, these are also the codes that I've consulted on. And this uh, is, you know, 95% just to brag right now, but uh, that was a joke to all you muted um, listeners. Uh, I, I know about these systems. I know about these codes really well. If you want to ask questions uh, in the follow-up, please, please do. I'm happy to, I'm happy to elaborate on any of this. Uh, I, I'm not sure which portions of this is going to be the most interesting to folks, but uh, you know, we start off, this list starts off with like our classic natural building systems, hemp, hemp line, hempcrete, uh, the Adobe Cobb, straw bale, rammed earth. Um, but then we get into like rubble trench foundations, which were exist in a kind of odd way in the IRC right now. And uh, we have a proposal expanding that to 
um, monolithic uh, precast concrete and the low carbon concrete building code that uh, Marin, California, first of its kind, Marin, California adopted recently, you know, tiny homes uh, falls in here. And there's also many national international examples, uh, primarily uh, prescriptive examples. Uh, Germany's got a great one. There's a number of others in Europe, but New Zealand has a wonderful performance based uh, uh, natural building code that, and they're a seismic country, a seismically active region. So it's, it's very helpful to us. That code is, it's uh, been a kind of model that we've based a lot of things on. So here I am in Rochester. Uh, there's Martin Hammer. Uh, he's been the author of almost every one of those codes I just shared, not all of them, um, especially the IRC appendice uh, suite. I'll say, and this is shortly before we testified for the hemp lime, hemp crete uh, uh, code that was adopted. Here, here's them voting on the hemp crete code. It was uh, a, a really nice moment to see it pass the first time around. This uh, wonderful group of folks, which you, many of you know, at least some of them or all of them. I, I saw Henry moderating uh, Joshua English's talk just a moment ago in the other track, and uh, that just everyone here contributed their knowledge set in a fabulous way, very organized. The committee, they don't like a lot of people coming up and talking for each code because they, you know, they want things to move along. And they even complimented us on how organized we were and how efficiently we delivered the information and didn't duplicate uh, conversation. And that goes a long way with them. And the information was accurate and it was uh, thorough uh, and, and succinct. And so that that was a great success. I, I really want to applaud the, the entire hemp building community that uh, took part in this effort. I I only I really only focus on the engineering side, um, and I'll, I'll talk about how that applies to to the code, uh, the engineering realm. But there's so many other people taking part in all the other aspects. Um, uh, probably not more important than structure, but equally important, I'd say. Um, so natural building uh, structural systems is like i said I, we work um we work with all of them um and if you have any project uh, in the realm of alternative building materials uh that you would like assistance with or just consulting or just a conversation about let be please reach out um verdantstructural.com is our website and uh the but i I like to look at these systems in kind of four different, from four different lenses, and really uh, they're co conventional construction lenses. The first being similar to wood frame construction. And uh, this has its pros and its cons. I just heard Joshua English talking about how um, the, it's uh, sustainable wood products is a is a it's a dirty topic uh, not not dirty like it's shady it's just a messy one um that there's a lot of variables a lot of inputs the the production and consumption of wood is uh uh but but we love wood i you know but it can be complicated but man uh, contractors know it they know it really well in our country other countries and not so much we're one of the uh only dominantly uh residential wood building uh countries in the world. So many others, uh, you know, de deforestation and whatnot has caused them to turn away from that construction type. But the hemp lime and hempcrete building code is based on uh, the lead embracing option. And I, I don't, I, you can probably see my cursor here, but it's the top one, uh, the top row, and they abbreviate it LIB. And it's but this code is limited to seismic design categories A, B, and C. And lead embracing in the code in general is list, limited to seismic design categories A, B, and C, which have a lot of reach throughout the country. And many of you probably live in an A, B, or C category, uh, but I do not. And in California, therefore, anytime uh, we're building with hempcrete, we'll cite many of the uh, provisions in the recently adopted appendix, but will technically be on alternative material. And the lead embracing solution probably isn't going to work. Uh, and, you know, separating out our lateral resisting system. And I say lateral resisting system, that means our earthquake and wind resisting system, um, which in this case, lead embracing, most wood buildings use plywood shear wall. Um, you can isolate plywood shear walls, maybe away from your hemp lime, or just have a few of them that you feel confident in the moisture exchange. You really need to talk to your builder and your architect about that. 
Good time for me to note that I'm not an architect. I'm not a moisture expert. I'm not a thermal expert. I'm not a glazing expert. Um, wa I'm not a waterproofing expert. Uh, so, but I, I do know enough to be dangerous and can answer questions on those subjects. And we will talk a little bit about fire and thermal testing later on that I engage with, with the Cobb Research Institute and, and uh, other EPA pursuits. But um, there's also uh, straw bale has um, uh, through some thermal modeling justified uh, plywood sheathing exterior over the bale walls, which previously was strongly recommended to stay away from. Uh, but there are a number of climate zones in the United States that it's fine to do uh, when you uh, pay attention to the, the total perms of your uh, exterior finish. And so a system called the bow, BOABS, which is bales on end, uh, which is the sitting them up tall and put, which is about a two foot modular module. It varies with the type of bale you use, but if you're using three string rice bales here in California, it's 24 inches. And so you have your framers come in, set up a 24 inch on center framing wall, put plywood on the outside. There's your shear walls. You're doing a little notching for hold downs if you can't use the strap solution, but it's it's something they're used to doing. And as long as they do it at 24 inches on center, which we've had a number of jobs where we come out and they actually just framed it at 16 and they didn't see that note on the drawings and it creates a hassle anyway. But um, then also with uh, light straw clay also takes the lead embracing approach uh, in their appendix in the IRC. And the folks that we work with, with light straw clay and, and with hemp in higher seismic zones, we are just decoupling the lateral system from, from that. We're isolating it in one portion of the wall, making a really strong area, which can be done with strong walls. It can be done with plywood. Uh, it can be done with moment frames or other cross brace, steel cross brace systems. If you if you have a really big building or, um, or you just love steel. Um, but then there are the materials that are similar to concrete or CMU, SMU, look, sorry, that's a typo, um, concrete masonry units or cinder blocks. And the, both well-codified systems, systems that uh, the industry knows well, building departments, I, I haven't mentioned that building departments feel a lot more comfortable when you're using a something that looks like what they're used to. And so here's a image from the uh, Cobb appendix, appendix AU, and they, they put A in front of all the appendix letters which I think just means appendix, but we say appendix and then we say AU and I think it's silly, but that's the way they decided to do it recently. That was a recent change in the code. But here you can see that uh, a, a lot of the um, approaches to uh, Adobe, Cobb, CEB, or Earthbag or Super Adobe, which are a little different. And I, we can talk about that if you'd like. Uh, you know, there's an internal reinforcing system commonly. You can have an uh, external mesh but these systems are so heavy that um, the capacity of that system, uh, it's it doesn't always meet up with the demand in your area if you're in a higher seismic zone. And, and another fact about seismic, I talk a lot about seismic, but it, it's this translates just on a lower level to wind everywhere. And uh, but for those that don't know, seismic force, demand force is uh, the is directly related to weight of the building. So when you have a, a thick wall system, uh, you're going to have higher seismic demand forces. And off and these systems are weaker than um, concrete or CMU, but they, uh, and and so there, there's there's a trade-off there because you're, you got this heavier system and it's weaker than the, um, than the conventional system. So we got to find the sweet spot. And sometimes these just aren't the right answer for higher seismic zones. And sometimes hempcrete and uh, light straw clay might not be the right answer because of the lead embracing complication. If, if you start making compromises, you're not interested in there's, there's other, there's other routes you can explore. Uh, that's, that's why I'd like to keep an eye on all of them. I, I don't think anyone's the right solution for every situation. Um, and you know, maybe they, I won't except, except for hemp, uh, hemp conference. Uh, I'll say that hemp, uh, hemp's the best today. Um, and it, this, these types of materials are also ones that start to explore stabilization, which means the addition of uh, cement mixes or emulsified asphalt. Emulsified asphalt has a notably lower carbon footprint uh, because it can be recycled. Uh, and especially when you're using cement as a stabilizer, you really want to focus on keeping that down because uh, just concrete walls is, um, you know, from eight to 16 um, um percent cement in their mix. And it's it was common previously for uh, earthen wall systems, rammed earth. Oh, rammed earth should be on here. Uh, 
uh, that's an obvious concrete um, equivalent, but they can uh, they can have up to 10 percent easy. Um, the uh, the recent ICCES report uh, for uh, Super Adobe uh, re requires 10 percent cement. And when you put the same amount of cement in a wall system that's significantly thicker than a concrete wall system, you, you're better off in a carbon sense to just be building a concrete wall if you want to. Um, Thermal is another important subject here. Uh, this is a mass wall system, but mass the fact that it's a mass wall system doesn't solve all your thermal problems. You still have some thermal um, requirements and the Cobb Research Institute engaged in uh, uh, a testing sample uh, situation. And we found that, that density matters and uh, you get about 0.22 uh, R value per inch with your heaviest average density around 100, 110 pound per cubic foot. But uh, you can get down to, I believe it's 1.25. I'd have to look at that number if you're using a density of 70 pounds per cubic foot, but um, your compressive strength values will decrease. So you you might need to make more architectural compromises because of that. Or uh, if you're building in an area that doesn't have such a demand on your compressive strength, you know, all these things are relating because these are natural building systems. They're not highly, engineered for strength and performance um the, their main their main benefit is their low embodied carbon and their uh they can be sourced cheaply though as we all know you can make these buildings as expensive as you want and labor is a is a major cost in our country and so labor source um and and labor type uh, you know it's worth talking that some a lot of people build cob by hand but it can be mechanized built uh, mechanically I, I i consult with a operation out of Indiana, it's a startup that's doing drone built cob, uh, actually, it's just a surprise to most people to hear, but they, they really have a fun thing going on. They're called Terran Robotics. But so yeah, labor source, labor type, how, um, that it means a lot for cost. So everybody's always talking about cost for good reason, especially in today's day and age. Um, the, uh, the third of four systems I'll talk about here is, uh, I call this one unique, but this is site built full bale straw bale construction, which uh, uses the bales as a masonry. Again, something we're all used to as a building type. Uh, they're like giant fuzzy blocks. Uh, and you can use this gravity wise. You can have it be a load bearing system, which is shown on the left, where uh, you, you typically pre-compress the bales before you put your plaster on to make sure they aren't going to sink and cause, um, you, you know, a waviness in your roof. Uh, or you can have it be post and beam show, shown on the right. And uh, but the the wind and earthquake system is typically a reinforced or unreinforced plaster if you're in a really mild wind and, and earthquake zone. That's an option in the code. And this reinforced plaster, most stucco contractors uh, use a mesh of some sort in their plaster mixes. But having an engineer involved in that and specifying its nailing pattern on the seal plate and top plate is something they're not used to. And maybe the type of mesh um, a thicker gauge, a 14 gauge mesh uh, versus their ch the chicken wire that that's typical uh, is something there that's not as common. And so if you find a bail practitioner, this is this is um, tried and true for them. They've been probably doing this for a while. But if you're engaging with a conventional contractor, because maybe you don't have someone who's done a lot of bail work around you, um, this is going to be a more unique system, probably going to take them more time. And therefore, again, labor equals money. But then it, but we engineer this system all the time. It's, it's the the, the system we've engineered the most. Um, and straw bale is the system we've worked with the most. Um, mostly, I think, due to its rectilinear form um, and the investment it got from the state of California in the early 90s, mid 90s with the Ecological Building Network and Bruce King. Uh, and uh, But it, obviously, we are well aware that the legal issues around hemp uh, hold, hold that material back and um, you know, I could go on uh, all the reasons I believe that straw bale is kind of in front right now uh, or has been and why that isn't necessarily because it's it's the only good option. Um, the here I wanted to bring up prefab and there's I, I have a I have BAMCOR um, and two straw bale prefab companies here. I, I see uh, Matt Marino is speaking, he might be speaking right now, uh, uh, and we've been helping him engineer his prefab hemp system recently. And so there there are, as you're aware of, um, 
their hemp systems mostly in development. I, I don't know of a lot of them that are um, really fully deployed um, in a way that they'd be shipping across the country or um, or things of that sort. But uh, these there's pros and cons. But um, again, changing up your labor source is it is it in the factory? Is it prefab? But then the complications of prefab on site. You know, you, you have unique um, connection details. Bamcor, um, there they. They've run the carbon numbers that they're shipping bamboo, but by barge um, from uh, internationally, and uh, they're they're finding that it's uh, it's it's not a high carbon tax. I'm sorry, you might be hearing my two two year olds in the background. Uh, the uh, but they they've designed a whole connection system that's unique to them. These tracks that uh, are the sill plate and top plate, and uh, it's it's a wonderful system. I, I highly recommend all these uh, eco cocoon and new frameworks. Um, um, great people, everyone, uh, you know, doing it for the right reasons. In, in my opinion, from what I've observed, um, I want to s mention uh, I have another prefab system, and it's and it's one that Verdon's developing right now. But I just want to take a moment to to mention the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation Research Program in our at, uh, in the U.S. national government. For anyone who has a small business, for-profit business, it doesn't apply to nonprofits, which is where I've done most of my natural building work. Um, there is a decent amount of funding for good ideas in the EPA, the DOE, uh, the, uh, the Ag Department. And I learned about this, I think it was, yeah, two years ago, short, shortly after my, uh, well, before and after my children were born. And they, uh, we, we picked an idea that had been floating around in my head. I've been contracted to design a number of prefab systems for folks, uh, each with unique needs of that project. And um, just the idea of getting a, a chunk of money to think freely of a project's confinement and what would, it, what would the broader public uh, once, in my opinion, from what we've seen, and uh, and we we got we got phase one and phase two of this EPA grant, and we're working on this prefabricated straw structural insulated panel right now, which we're starting beta um, in the fall, and uh, we we hope to deploy our second beta version, which is where uh, other engineering firms can be engineering and um, deploying beta, and then by fall of next year, we we hope to deploy this product uh, we're going to start with um you know we we have a number of steps this isn't a presentation about this sip product but if you're interested in, in staying up to date uh our um you know i have a few slides uh, the thickness of bale construction is um is an issue and so our primary goal is to modify and manipulate the uh a loose straw inflip infill that will allow for a five and a half inch um stud wall cavity equivalent plus finishes uh rain screen and that's radically smaller than uh, what's on the market right now for um, uh, for bale construction, but uh, can be similar to some uh, hemp hemp approaches. Uh, but again, pre prefab um, uses a SIP approach where we're we're putting a sheathing on, and uh, so I, it, you know something that doesn't uh, doesn't relate as well to a hemp system. But hemp has other benefits and other ways you can go about that. You know. We could we could talk about all these for a long time, but I don't want to hang on one subject for too long. But if anybody's, you know, please keep in mind if these are uh, bringing up questions for you, and we can talk about it uh, at the end here. And I I don't know if I noted that my company specializes. We 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 range from residential to mid rise mixed use construction. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, one of our uh, five stories structures is being built right now. That's about as high as we go. And we we're interested in staying engaged in bigger systems because we want to help scale these materials. And, and you can't you can't really play a big role if you're not uh, in the game and, and feeling how it works from the inside. And so that's really where we see a product like this um, being most helpful is uh, is taking straw and natural building systems to a two a, two a three to five story structure. And, you know, there's uh, fire code limitations and uh, happy to talk about all that if that's interesting to anyone. And uh, of course, we're documenting the amount of carbon we could store if, you know, these uh, financial and uh, product predictions over five years um, span, uh, pan out. And it's it's a tremendous amount. And this is the carbon track. And a lot of people have been talking about carbon today, but it's something else um, I'd be happy to discuss with anyone uh, low carbon. Concrete is a real focus of our firm as well. Um, 
I engaged with the development of that low carbon concrete building code in Marin County. A wonderful effort by the um, um, the Ecological Building Network and uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum. Uh, and testing, I, uh, I as as I said, we've engaged with a, a, a number of university and private testing labs, um, and and we're constantly analyzing testing from elsewhere. There's no, as as people know, there's there's no really well funded natural building um, trade group uh, like Concrete has, like CMU has, uh, that's funding test after test after test. And so when we get one, uh, we want to make sure we do it right. We want to make sure we do it to the um, uh, to the right standards, and uh, and it it ends up being a pretty valuable tool. Um, the uh, hemp. It, it, when the development of the hemp line code, uh, the lead embracing lateral system uh, was our route for the lateral system allowed uh, into the appendix. Appendix, and it is like I said, only uh, limited to size and design categories A, B, and C. But it also requires gypcrete on the interior face, and uh, it requires studs at 16 inches on center. Two things that most hemp builders don't want to do, and so we were able to justify removing the gypcrete based on two studies. Here's one from England and here's another one from France, both of which tested um, hemp crete systems within stud frames uh, versus uh, lead embracing type systems, some with uh, gyp, some without. And the hempcrete on its own, even the versions without any lead embracing, uh, perform outperformed the other systems. And we found this to be a, a, a bold documentation that uh, uh, making that step away from the prescriptive standard prescriptive requirement of lead embracing in the code was justified in this case. But more testing is needed. Uh, this uh, for size design category A, B, and C, and, and following all the other conservative requirements of the IRC, um, this we were able to get this passed without the um, GIP creep. But to make any bolder move than that, we're going to need more testing um, based on ASTM. Uh, uh, ASTM is an international organization, but um, the these tests these tests were not done uh, to ASTM standards. And though they were done to a high standard, but uh, the ICC, the International Code Council, they're picky and about your source. And so when you when you start to graduate beyond beyond A, B, and C seismic design categories, um, or you want to do something e even even more liberal, like possibly removing the lead embracing uh, or spacing the studs wider uh, it, than 16 inches on center in the code, I'm happy to design. A 24 inch on center wall for anyone uh that's it's it's just if you're prescriptively following the code that's um that's a limitation that had to remain because of this but uh been talking with jacob and and the rest of um the hemp community that i've engaged with about testing there was an email that just went out with uh, my former alma mater penn state university there's some contacts there and uh about getting in plane and out of plane testing rolling so that in the next code cycle, which is three years, the code cycles are three years, <coughs> we can uh, have the tools we need to make a bigger step uh, in flexibility for hemp line construction. Here's that other test I, I mentioned. Now, again, source the source of your testing information. The, this is a Cobb fire test that was just conducted in December in Texas uh, that I went down to. I, I was the engineer. I, I did the structural engineering portions of it. There's a structural engineering loading component to this test. It's uh, ASTM E119. The um, Whereas hemp passed the first round and did not cite any fire rating in the hemp lime appendix, the... Uh, Cobb did not pass the first round. It had to go back to public comment, which happens about um, uh, six months later. You don't have to wait. You get a second try before you have to wait the next three years. And we luckily and uh, gratefully, we passed um, in the public comment, but we removed, we were citing a one hour fire rating for this material that as most of you know, people make ovens and chimneys out of. Um, and we were citing tests, uh, international tests, um, well-documented tests, but they weren't ASTM E119. 
And so the so they they threw out our proposal. Uh, it was wild that this generally fireproof material failed on fire, and and they praised its and and this this heavy lower strength material, um, you know, was praised for its its structural design in the um, in the appendix in the first round. But you know that's just the way it goes. That you there's they're strict about their rules, even if they don't quite make sense given uh, the circumstance. Um, but this, uh, and I, again, another test that the U S hemp building association is, um, uh, pursuing engaging with it, it, it can be expensive. I, I, um, there's a, a multiple tens of thousands of dollars went into this cob test. Um, my time was donated and the, the people's here, Art Ludwig really, uh, was the, um, genesis of this test. Uh, he, uh, he's got a lot of interest in, in cob and other, um, mass natural building systems as, uh, as safe uh, fire rebuild materials that don't contribute uh, to the continuing global warming problem that a fire bunker or a concrete bunker would. Um, Laura Bartels and, and Jess, a Terrabellum collective down in uh, Austin, Texas, um, she was the main uh, builder during the test, but Sasha Rabin of uh, Quail Springs Permaculture um, and her husband, Jono, were down there leading the build too. Um, but you can see uh, these, these lines, what, what those lines in the center represent is that the interior face of the wall reached nearly 2000 degrees, which is the requirement of the ASTM E119. The outside face of the wall's temperature rose less than the temperature of the slab on the floor through the like ambient sun cycle of the day. This was a 12 inch wall and uh, hit, heated to 2000 degrees and, and you could put your hand easily on the outside and not feel any heat at all from the test. It, it was, uh, it performed really well. I was fighting with um, Google Slides earlier today, uh, trying to get this video. This is where I would play the video where um, this uh, Texan who probably loves his job has to, as another requirement of the ACME 109, blast it with a fire hose for two minutes. And you can see all kinds of material flaking off. It looked like it was uh, I couldn't really see well. I just saw this material. I thought it was going to be a failure. And all of a sudden it, it stops and the, the smoke lifts away. And I found that he actually didn't blast off that much at all. He kind of the vitrified layer. Um, and you can see the mesh, the, the this this wall system. There's a number of reinforcing systems you can use on cob building. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, stronger systems that, that Art loves, likes to build with. He's a uh, California resident and it has a uh, mesh on the interior and exterior, and uh, the you you can see the yellow straw that was just inches away from the surface uh, that was being burnt for two hours. Uh, it was a two-hour fire rating. It passed. We had two two different wall systems pass. Um, complications of testing uh, natural building systems are, are never small. I I go to labs and I stress to them. This is going to be really difficult. These systems are going to be heavier than everything else you're doing. And, you know, Cobb and Adobe is uh, uh, are, are heavier than hemp lime, but still hemp lime has a higher density than stick frame construction. And uh, if if you're working with a lab that's used to just toting around um, loose infill uh, insulation stick frame structures, they're 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 going to have a little bit of a different change when, when you bring your hemp lime wall in and um, you can either bring the builders and the materials to these labs that aren't, aren't used to having a bunch of clay around, or you can try to bring the lab um, out to the builders. And I've seen both fail um, like really significant investments. Each of these systems on the left, there's Santa Clara uh, university cob wall in plane tests and on the right, uh, Cal Polytechnics University um, brought their two grad students, uh, Julia and Desiree, uh, down with Professor Dan Jansen with, uh, um, and built the testing frame there. Both systems, the first wall just totally failed. The, 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 the system that they, the, the testing system failed and we got no data. We only had four walls on each of them. And, you know, all the effort that goes into this to, you, to lose one quarter of the data you're expecting uh, is notable but that's just we're some of the first people to ever test these wall systems on this kind of professional level and um so we're we're learning as we go and in the center is um the late dr mark ashheim which who forwarded the straw bale testing uh, uh regimen 
in in the biggest way he was an ally uh he he died unexpectedly and young in 2019 um but he was the lead of the civil engineering department at Santa Clara University and uh his contributions to natural building engineering can't be understated and um we're all grateful for the work that he he did there and again if I would have been able to play these videos you would see right now on the right Desiree hand pumping the rig they brought out to the um uh, out to Quail Springs Permaculture which is kind of north uh east of uh LA and Ventura uh, in Southern California and uh, and you would see on the on the left, you would see all these, you know, builders running running around this this lab, uh, just stomping clay with their feet and stuff that this lab has definitely never seen. And um, it, both the fire testing lab and Santa Clara um, had to rent forklifts um, special for moving these walls around. And both of them didn't believe us when we told them that that just just the fact in the first place and it ended up being a major issue down the line. I could talk more about, um, there, there are more complications I can discuss, but something fun about testing these systems for the first time is that you discover things that people didn't expect. And, um, you know, a rock rocking shear behavior on uh, raw cob or straw only cob cob that doesn't have steel reinforcing in it. And it's a total reinforcing system is straw, um, a straw matrix. I don't, recommend you call um a a straw only mix an unreinforced mix it does have a bio microfiber reinforcement microfiber reinforcement is a real thing in the industry um it's commonly done with steel um but that's the actions you're seeing here and the material uh was strong enough to withstand its load and pick itself in uh, the whole way up you can see it lifting off the ground which then means rocking shear behavior allows it to use its own weight to resolve that force. And this was a big discovery that, um, that not a single professor uh, that I worked with um, thought was going to happen. So it's just, um, yeah, that's, I, I used to work with a, a former Cal football player and he said his coach would say, well, that's why we play the game uh, to find out who wins. And uh, so that's why we, that's why we do this. Um, here I got to engage with the University of Berkeley on the, uh, EPA straw sip panel project, uh, some in-plane lateral systems that break the rules of the, the stick frame plywood shear walls. And we wanted to see, uh, is, it, is it still performing if we don't have uh, this exact edge nail requirement that the NDS, which is the wood code, plywood code, implements. And it was great to get to work with them. I live in Berkeley. Um, and so it was close to home. But Still, a lot of interesting. I don't even have a straw stuffed panel here. Um, I'm sorry, I should have got that photo. But uh, again, so things go wrong. You don't expect things take longer um, when you're bringing up like truckloads of straw into this lab. They're looking at you like you're crazy. But um, it's you know that just what needs to be done. And this is like what's next. Anybody's interested in getting involved in testing? If if you're thinking about going to grad school, if you know someone in grad school looking for a project, if you know a professor, if you got a whole bunch of money burning a hole in your pocket, if you love applying for grants, um, these this is a list um, generally comprehensive, um, but some of the topics are like many options for research for all natural building materials. Uh, for thermal fire and acoustics, you know, that covers a lot there. But there are a lot of things that are um, untested, undertested, and the future of natural building and future of engineering and design will, uh, wants to see this uh, codified, this information documented uh, in textbooks and, and being able to be used efficiently and confidently so we don't have to put such huge safety factors on things um, to get them through building departments. Um, I have not done work with testing bamboo. I just saw that, uh, um, but I, I have done work designing bamboo and exploring the international codes on bamboo. Co connections of the round material are uh, always a real complication uh, that I find with bamboo. It's, and uh, it, you, it's just not the same. You can get solid bamboo as a lot of people know, but um, you know, wall, wall thickness and diameter uh, and, and then getting a connector in without splitting, depending on, I mean, if you have a solid piece, you're unlikely to do that. Some people fill the, the bottom cores with concrete, um, but the, uh, anyway, bamboo is a really interesting material, but then there's Bamcor who are kind of breaking the, breaking the mold, making a new mold, breaking it down and creating these panels, these flat panels. So there's a lot of, you, you know, you may know more about the subject than I do. Um, 
but yeah, here's uh, where uh, I'm engaging with the University of San Diego right now through Cal Earth, the Super Adobe um, operation, one of, one of the largest, certainly the largest in the nation for Super Adobe, probably internationally, but they're pursuing a IRC appendix um, that uh, myself, Martin Hammer, David Eisenberg, uh, another real, real leader in code development, um, and just, wow, I'm calling out names. Uh, uh, Jacob uh, Waddell did an amazing job in uh, herding the cats uh, uh, for the hemp lime pursuit. And I just want to give him a shout out. I um, And gosh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all. Please reach out if, uh, if you have any questions or uh, want to. Yeah. So thank you. Anthony, thank you so much. That was so much information and it was all very organized. You had great slides. I love it. Um, <laughs> looks like we had a couple questions come in. Um, let's see. Uh, have you done work or testing with bamboo? Yeah, I just spoke to that a second ago and um, no. no. And there, I, I noted in the one of those earlier slides, it's it is a material that doesn't have any code representation domestically that I'm aware of. And that only small diameter bamboo does grow efficiently in the United States. So the good timber bamboo um, needs to be shipped in. We have done international work with it, uh, but I haven't uh, engaged in, um, in testing with bamboo specifically. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, okay, so here's another one. Within the building codes, how feasible would it be to use a timber frame for the structural component along with hemp lime infill? Uh, it would be, uh, it's certainly a, a reasonable thing to do, especially in low seismic zones. Timber frames, um, now there's two kinds of timber frames. There's the one that you might see under a deck, and then there's a, a, a buckling uh, restrained brace frame, uh, BRB. And heavy timber has started to use a hybridized um, kind of glue lamb wrap of a steel um, steel inner core. And when you see those um, CLT buildings going up, the and you see that big timber cross brace, that's a that's a small steel element. And the timber is doing the compression force, and uh, so that can get you all the way anywhere you want to go. Those are really strong and expensive. But the uh, just a timber brace frame is not as strong and um, won't, uh, you know, size design category D, very questionable if you're going to be able to get that passed. Depends on, you know, your size, your building, your weight of your building. But um, the let in bracing system that is the lateral system for size design categories A, B, and C in the hemp appendix is uh, just a simple cross brace that's, um, it's, it's like a one by four or similar one by six that's cut into the studs. Uh, it's an old timey kind of way of cross bracing. You might see if you open up an old house, uh, look at the guts. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, how about if you had to guess looking at the current pace when home developers can start building the hemp on the same level as normal current building techniques. So yeah, when when do you think the pace will catch up from hemp or natural building to the usual? The conventional systems, I, I so many things are involved. I, um, Massey Burke is a close collaborator of mine. She's the director of CASBA, the California um, Straw Builders Association. And uh, she's also uh, one of our lead project leads on the straw panel project uh, that I've been mentioning. Uh, and she jokes about how just maybe two years ago, it felt like um, the greater community was saying, geez, we're never going to scale. Uh, we've been working at this, our elders and things, people we learn from. And then all of a sudden, it feels like the whole nation's looking at us, talking about embodied carbon, saying, why aren't you scaling fast enough? We need this. We don't have anything else to use. And uh, so I, I think that we will see a, a kind of dam breaking um, moment if we all keep our eye on the prize and 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 realizing things that I think um, when this community uh, when the natural building community in the U.S. started it uh, it was nonprofits and people just trying to get by trying to find any way to build this but now uh, that we have established companies for you know and uh, and uh, science and data and testing 
that we can go after these larger grants and really start to catch up in the funding level with these conventional materials, which, like I said, have these trade groups that just do test after test after test. And if we had the answers to all those tests in that one of those last slides I had, uh, I think that uh, there's a lot more people would be interested. Um, it's just when when you t show a conventional builder that, uh, you know, you're working off one or two tests that I and we may be very confident in, they don't know the system that well. And so it's it, it's a hurdle. So yeah. there's yeah. the non answer to that question. Uh, no, well said, um, <laughs> that it's the truth. So that it's good, <laughs> good, good answer. Um, oh, let me see, we got another question from uh, our board, one of our board of directors. Um, we know now that Ukraine will need to rebuild 30% of its structures. Do you believe hemp could be used as the main material there? Yes, if they have, a, um, I, I'm not so clear on um, what structural system hemp would use if wood was scarce and it wouldn't surprise me if wood would be scarce following an event like this. Um, but perhaps pe people are going to be bringing in all kinds of materials. So so maybe wood might be one of them. But most hemp building involves wood frame. And uh, so I, I think there's real potential. And it's something I, I've been when uh, when the original Haiti, um, not the original Haiti earthquake, they've been ha having earthquakes since the beginning of time. But um, when the Port-au-Prince earthquake hit and the um, Ecological Building Center pulled folks together in the in the Nepal earthquake of about uh, eight years ago happened. Uh, there's been groups of um, people who care about helping folks build safely and naturally and trying to offer examples that are culturally appropriate and sensitive. And I think that this will be a time, it's very delicate to do international work and step in and share how you think other people should rebuild their country. But um, I think it will be an appropriate time for a community that I would be happy to take part in um, to, to offer suggestions if, if they're asking. Oh, can you hear me? I had a little froze. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And then we have another, um, if you had to pick one building material, which one would it be? <laughs> What, what's your um, favorite? Well, yeah, um, I, I've, I came out here designing straw bale buildings, um, and I, so I, it's got a soft spot in my heart. But it's, uh, it's got all the complications I mentioned. I, I'm constantly letting people know that you know there's hemp bad insulation out there um, that. And if you get an engineer and a concrete batch plant that understands how to bring carbon down in your mix, you can build what's. Uh, a very conventional seeming building that has really low carbon. Uh, you don't have to do something radical. So there's part of me that never wants to forget about that. But I, yeah, I, I love, I like them all. I can't pick one. Uh, there's ones that I think are, you know, not for the weak of heart, you know, and that when someone comes in and wants a cob building, I often try to convince them to build a straw bale building. If they don't, then they pass the test. Um, mm -hmm. Because right now with the state of research and the state of construction knowledge, it's hard, it's going to be harder for them. Um, but it's not because I, I don't like it as much. I, um, I think cob and, and hemp ha and straw, but um, especially the, the more monolithic systems have uh, tr a tremendous potential to um, ease the mind of a fire rebuild family mm -hmm. in the same way that a concrete building might. Um, and straw is also uh, proven. There's great white papers on the Casper website about um, the fire success existing bills have had in, in recent fires in California and things. But still, I think that psychological thing and knowing that there's straw in there, sometimes a, mm -hmm. an adobe or a hemp, uh, hemp line building. Oh, yeah, that. interesting. So it, it depends is my answer. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I'll, okay. That's <laughs> fair. That's fair. Um, let's see. Maybe you answered this one um, also when you were speaking. When a state adopts a current version of the IRC, is it just by default, the appendix accepted as well? No, most states adopt the IRC, the body of the code. And um, some things are in the body of the code, like the rubble trench um, is in the body of the code, that that portion. Uh, Adobe is in the body of the International Building Code now, which it actually was just removed. And we're going to be going to um, uh, Louisville in September to uh, propose an uh, 
a slight shift in that in in what was um, documented. But the appendices are are there are a few states that adopt them all. They just adopt them. Um, but most states, um, some of them just don't adopt any of them. And um, but I, I I believe most states go one by one and see if they if they want to adopt them. And California adopts some and not others. Um, Straw is adopted. Cobb is not adopted in California because there was a major error on the ICC's part in in put in labeling the appendix inaccurately. And um, it, it was a very bizarre thing that we wouldn't have known about until we were at the hearing for California to adopt the code. It was virtual because the pandemic was going on. And, um, and they were like, we're not going to adopt this because it says here that it's not real. And then we went back, ICC changed it. They apologized. They tried to give us some compensation for it. But um, so yeah. anyway, uh, it's, it's a little complicated. Each state does it differently. It's unfortunate like that. Um, but I guess there's a lot of things like that in our nation that states do differently than one another. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that information and clearing that up for us. Um, another question back to you speaking about which was your favorite building material. Um, which is the fastest to dry, do you think? Typically. Well, a dry I straw guess. ballot is definitely. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, or, or if you're getting a yeah pre prefab panel that's already all set and done, or if you're getting uh, like BAM core or something, um, the, uh, but uh, like a, a thick cob wall takes a while. Adobe, they all dry individually because they're smaller units. You, you make them all at once. And that's a benefit mm -hmm. to Adobe versus cob, but Adobe's masonry and that masonry adds complication, especially if you're looking for an in internal reinforcing system based on if, if you need that in your area. Um, but hemp lime, I, uh, I haven't, uh, I, I, I believe it's in the middle. It's probably, you know, it's obviously straw, straw doesn't, straw should be dried with, when you get it. Hemp lime is likely next in line, uh, especially I, the, um, uh, uh, what's that, what's that, uh, Medicalin, um, uh, speed upgrades that you can add to the process. And, and then you get into, uh, uh, Cobb and Adobe and, and probably in between hemp and Cobb and Adobe is super Adobe or earth bag construction. Uh, and CEB is also like Adobe and probably f faster than Adobe. So I don't know that generally that's Fascinating. a sloppy, sloppy lineup. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, well, uh, that looks like that's all of our questions, unless anyone has anything um, to add. But we are wrapping things up. Thank you again, Anthony, so much for sharing, you know, just your wealth of knowledge. Um, we appreciate you and your work so, so much. 